we're back. It's Liz and Jamie casting off Follow the Boat. From the same location as the last podcast, which is the first time we've done that for quite a few episodes, which I think is testament to just how comfortable we've got in this anchorage here, which is, uh, it's by Lab- the town of Labuan Bajo, which is on the west side of the island of Flores, so to the east of Lombok and Bali. And at the moment we have got the ASEAN Symposium, annual symposium, just about to start here next week. And with it, that means 500 million military ships and boats all turfed out of the harbour. And they're now all anchored right next to us. So there will be a bit of noise, we think. Mainly helicopters, I think, spying on us, making sure we're not a security threat. It's all very exciting anyway. (laughs) Shall we get on with what we were supposed to be talking about and what was that and also why are we talking about it? Because this is very much your idea. I can't remember why I came <laughs> up with this one, but I thought it would make an interesting, interesting discussion. And not just for liverboards and sailors, but I think for people on land, because what I wanted to talk about was how cruising has changed us. Because, you know, we've been doing it for a little while now. We're a little bit older and a little bit wiser, maybe less so on the wise side. Yeah, speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but, but certainly we, we have changed and our outlook has changed on a, a number of uh, topics and areas. And then I realised, well, this is just us on a boat and our experience on a boat. But who is to say that we wouldn't have gone through a lot of these changes ourselves were we living on land? Yeah, I think that's the interesting thing. It's, um, so there are three things. There's we're just getting older, so we're changing anyway. We're living on a boat and that definitely does shape you. But also there's the travel element. Mm. You know, so we've travelled a lot. We've spent a lot of time, 17 years, away from our own country. So those three things are the major influences on the way we are now. And some of them will cross over to Mm. non-sailors. Shall we go through them? Uh, Because I've got a list, you've got a list. They they will conflict, no doubt. Before you go through your amazing list, Elizabeth, (laughs) we should just give a shout out to everyone who responded to this. And you put up a picture (laughs) across our social media, but the one on Instagram was most interesting, partly because we got over a thousand likes on it. Yeah, that's I think, not... I think it's our most popular uh, post ever, isn't it? Yes, it's really strange. We had no idea and still have no understanding of why it was liked so much. But it showed a before and after. So it showed us back in 2007. I think I dated it out. I wasn't quite sure if it's 2006. Anyway, kind of that time. And right now. Hmm. To, and it, just showing the differences in the way we look. And unfortunately, that kind of meant people just commented on that, didn't they? Yes, they didn't so much because we were looking for people's comments, ideas and suggestions on how cruising has changed them as well. Yes. We'll come on to those in a moment. But it was worth mentioning the number of people, starting with Kevin Berry, of course, is one of our friends and patrons who said that our smiles are much bigger. And uh, Aknila Nida, excuse me if I got that name wrong, uh, Clay Peter and B Moody were just a few people who all said our smiles over the last 17 years have got bigger and wider. And we're, want, we're generally just happier. I wonder if that's true or whether it's just the photos <laughs> no, I chose. It's a picture, you know. <laughs> you know what photography is like. It captures one one moment. Mm. Uh, a couple of people said that my tattoo had faded, but yeah. I, I didn't understand that because you can't see the tattoo in the second picture. So They're right there. They're obviously clever, aren't they? Yes. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so thank you ever so much, ever so much indeed for all your lovely, flattering comments, which are always lovely to read. But also thank you very much for those people who shared with us some of the changes that you've seen in yourself. Not necessarily sailors. We've got travellers and workers with, with their, their ideas about life as well. Do you want to start then, since yeah. this is your podcast? It's my podcast, is it? Yeah, oh, thank you very much. Hello, I'm Liz. And I'm Jamie. Welcome to Follow the Boat, in which we discuss what it's really like to give it all up to live on a boat. And go travelling around the world. We've been doing it since 2006, and we're still at it. Each week we talk about our latest YouTube video. And about boats, sailing, travel, or anything else which floats into our heads. And if you leave a comment we like, we'll give you an answer and a name check. Peace Peace and and fair fair winds. Okay. So I wanted to kick off with one thing that no one mentioned at all. 
I remember back in, uh, it was some years ago now, and I was sitting there with my extended family back home in the UK. And I made the observation to them that cruising has slowed me down and made me more patient. Mm. And they all burst out laughing at the same time. <laughs> and I was quite upset Aww. by that because I genuinely feel as if over the last 20 years or so that I have learned patience and have slowed down. Um, you know, when I look back to how I was living my life before I met you in my 20s, I mean, I was, I was living my life at 100 miles an hour, going out, uh, working hard, playing hard, uh, clubbing hard, doing all those things. And not so much ADHD, but I couldn't sit still for more than five minutes. I was just living so fast. Yes, I put something similar under a different category, but weirdly, I put patience as well. This, just for those who are listening and watching, we don't consult very much before these. We like to just do it off the cuff and present each other with our thoughts. So you're hearing it for the first time, just like Jamie is and I am. So under patience, I just did a little one, just mm -hmm. to join in here. I say here that I'm getting better at it, but I'm still working on this one. And I also say, it's something I've had to learn because I've been living with Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously though, it does come in handy to learn to be a little bit more patient than we, than we were before we started this, particularly when you're communicating people that don't speak your language in different cultures and just give it a bit of time to get your meaning across and understanding what they're saying to you. That's well, yeah. all I've got to say on it. Okay, uh, well that's not where I was coming from. Okay. I was talking literally the pace at which we are moving. Yes. You know, we sail at anything between five to eight knots. That's kind of sprinting speed, I suppose. So I forgot to look this up. I wanted to do a comparison. But in the UK, if you drove from, say, London to Manchester, that would take you three hours. It's 200 odd miles. Well, that could take us two days to cruise, stopping at uh, various anchorages. Easily. And we always like to, if you know, time's on our side and no deadlines. We always like to stay places, don't mm. we? That's why we're, we're probably the slowest cruisers I know. I think we are up there as the slowest <laughs> cruisers, definitely. But, you know, you're right, our interaction perhaps on a bureaucratic level and also, as you say, with local people trying to understand them. There are many ways in which cruising does put the brakes on. Yeah. And life is a lot slower. Yeah. And in, so, in most situations. So, do you, you? You're more patient now. You really think you're more patient now than when we started, say, two thousand five. Well, you only have to look at how we behaved when we first got the boat. When we were going out every night, partying, really sort of leading on from our lives on land. I think. I mean, obviously, you were, you know, working very hard, very hard, right up until the moment you left your job, and. Look at how we have slowed down since then and how much, for example, I'm quite happy just sitting in the cockpit, just okay. not feeling a need to jump in the dinghy and go ashore and race around, ticking off lists, doing things. Right. OK. So I've got that under less controlling. For me, patience is about being patient with people and being patient with time and when, when there are hold ups not getting, not kicking the furniture and screaming and shouting at people. That's something that I know I'm better at since being in Southeast Asia. That's because of the culture here. You can't kick and shout and scream till you get what you want over here. You simply wait and you smile when things go wrong and then eventually things get done. To me, that, that it, it's that side of patience that, that, uh, that I'm thinking about. Yep. When, you're, when you're talking about um, slowing down your pace of life, I've, I've put I'm less controlling because as you said, you know, I was working stupid hours before we did all this and one of the reasons we did it is because I kind of burnt out. So I put that, um, I also put that this isn't, is, is this just an age thing? Well, so I was, wanting to keep coming back to this yes. and I'd love to hear from people who don't live on a boat yeah. who feel the same way who perhaps feel that just generally through life as you get older you slow down obviously you slow down physically but do you also learn to exercise more patience as you get older is it just a product of getting older yes so was it just because I stopped working that I became less controlling eventually 
Uh, hold on. You're claiming that you're less controlling. Well, who right. well, who's, less who controlling. says that? Well, like, rather to, like you with... Go on, according to you. Rather like you with <laughs> patience and your family laughing at you, I admit that um, there's a certain amount of control freakery in me as there is in you. We're both the same. I don't know whether it's because we're the first children in the oh, definitely. in the siblings, and so we always chose, you know, decided what everyone was going to do. But anyway, <laughs> uh, all that cod psychology. Um, so before we came to live on a boat, I was living. I was living very hard, a very hard, you know, life. Schedules, appointments, meetings, diaries, calendar. Everything was planned out. It was work based, and when I wasn't at work, I planned out the weekends and the evenings. So I knew pretty much, you know, for the next few months exactly what I was going to be doing all of the time. It was all there in boxes. Mm. When I compare that to now, now I quite often don't know what day it is. And it's taken me years to get to that stage, I have to say. Mm. It took me a long time to get there. I said I was starting to feel better after the first few years, but now I really do not know what the day is sometimes. I can go for a couple of days thinking it's the other, the wrong day. And to be honest, the only thing that keeps me up to speed on what day of the week is, is these videos, because we have to get them out on a certain day. True. If we didn't have that routine... I'm quite glad. I'm glad we've got this routine. I no, I, I, I completely agree with you. I was just teasing you earlier. <laughs> I, I, it's, you're absolutely right. Uh, that feeling of just letting go and being at the whim, I mean, this goes on a sort of macro level, looking just at the weather, how you're at the whim of the weather. And so there is a part of you that does just have to let go. Yeah. And it's something that uh, Salty Lass had mentioned. Uh, they said, and we've talked about this as well, but they also said uh, this week on Discord that they've learned to become more fatalistic. As the sea and the wind never listen to reason or complaint, it is what it is should be a sailor's motto. So I think that's sort of slightly moving on from what we were talking about, but they're absolutely right. Just letting go of that control and just going with the flow. Yes, and fatalism is one of my favorite words. Um, I have believed for some time that I'm a fatalist. I really don't get upset too much in dangerous situations or when, like I used to. Mm -hmm. So before we set out going across oceans, when we were still in Turkey and still playing around on the boat and getting used to it and doing a bit of sailing here and there, I used to worry, lie in bed at night worrying about you falling overboard rather than me, because if you went overboard, I'd never be able to get you. And then worrying about myself going overboard, then worrying about being eaten by sharks, <laughs> <laughs> then worrying about being hit by lightning, all the things that we read in the comments yes. from people. Yes. Now that's interesting because that brings me on to something else that I've learned, and that is there are always two sides to a story. And by, what I mean by that is, is that both people and places need to be experienced by yourself uh, uh, rather than being told about it or oh, yes. read about it. As yes. you say, you know, reading the comments about all the things that could go wrong. It's not until you actually are in those situations yourself uh, that, that you learn both about yourself and about the situation. Yeah. And, and I think that also applies to uh, meeting other people, people perhaps you've heard about or read about before you met them. Yeah. It, it's just human nature to make up your own mind about whether you, you're going to like them or not before you've met them. Right, so what, 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 you're, what are you saying in that, what, what has changed? So, i get my words out. Yeah, so I think this, the, the pivot point was when, and I think I've mentioned this before, two occasions when we went down the Red Sea, the first was being told what Egypt was like by all the cruisers who came up through the Red Sea and having these preconceived ideas about what Egypt was going to be like and the people and how they were going to be out to always want backsheesh, you know, little backhanders for helping them out. And then of course getting there and realizing it was nothing like that mm. at all. And then that second occasion when we uh, curtailed a long trip to Asmara, the capital of Eritrea, mm. based on what someone else had told us about it the previous day. And when we got there, we realized that actually we could have stayed a whole week there because we loved it so much. So you're saying then that you used, in the olden days, you used to take people at their word. Correct. Without thinking about it. Not so much no. without thinking about it, but I, I think I've definitely swayed more, much more now to 
listening to what people say about something that I haven't experienced, mm. um, taking it on board a little, but always reserving uh, the majority of my judgment for that person or that place until I've actually been there myself. Yeah, now that is something that we've done recently. So we went to Bima on Sambawa, the island next to us. Right. And in the cruising guide, it says, uh, you know, it's a bit dirty. It's all right to get a few things. And there have been, it was a breeding ground for ISIS and things like that. So you think, whoa, do I want to go there? And then you think, well, hang on, this was written 2016. So it's, it's old information. Well, but also, even so also, one of our cruising friends who knows this area very well had said, yeah, it's a dirty old town. Dirty old town, dirty old town. So we still went there because we needed to get out of some quite powerful wind and it's down a sort of fjord. And we stopped at the top and then we carried on down and we thought, oh, we'll go here. And I'll admit that I was a little nervous when a number of boats immediately came up to us as we were anchoring. We're trying to plug us their details and bits and bobs. What did you think? Well, it turned out that those people who approached us, two boats, one of whom actually undressed himself in front of you and was completely stark bollock naked. Because he was, was having a wash. It was unnecessary. But it turned out that the other boat happened to be the person that we ended up using to take us ashore and pick up our diesel, who was then friends with Johnny, who took us around what turned out to be a delightful little town. Yes, and I was surprised at myself. It's only because of, we, of what I'd read and been told that I had these slight reservations, which I have not had in Indonesia the whole time we've been here. So it just shows you that I was still affected by what I'd read. I suppose, I mean, we still did leave the boat and went on their water taxi, if you like, for want of a better word, it wasn't really that, and uh, went round the town and did all the things that we would normally do. And by the end, of course, I was fine. But there was that little note of reservation in the back of my head, which I would never normally have here. Mm. And uh, you know, in contrast to that, I just went, I went with it. Didn't yeah, I? you did. Yeah, because that, that emboldened me really. And I, I think that was partly because I knew, well, look, it's Indonesia. Mm. It's just such a wonderful country when it comes to the people here. Mm. If you had been plonked into the middle of this situation from the West, I think you would immediately think that perhaps, you know, these guys were, uh, did want something from you. But it just turned out they were just being their usual Indonesian hospitable selves. Yeah, and I think that moves, unless you've got anything else to say, I think that moves us to one of the main things, um, which is about um, tolerance generally for, tra you learn tolerance towards other cultures and people when you travel. And if I can just read the Mark Twain quote that Terry Baker sent me, it is one of my favourites, just to explain what I'm saying, then we can discuss it. Travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry and narrow-mindedness, and many of our people need it sorely on these accounts. Broad, wholesome, charitable views of men and things can't be required by vegetating in one little corner of the earth all one's lifetime. Yeah, that's a, obviously it's a famous quote. Most of us heard of the first half. The second half is the bit that I haven't heard before. Yeah, it's the bit that uh, we don't hear so much. But it's absolutely true, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. So that was that. So there you were. There was me being all bigoted and intolerant before I got into Bima, which I shouldn't be after 17 years of travel. Mm. But it really, if you apply that to Indonesia, the difference between how we were before we came here and perhaps how other people are who haven't been here to what you actually find is. I mean, it's insurmountable, the difference, don't you think? Yeah, and I think this is something that uh, is perhaps different compared to someone living on land, unless, of course, that person living on land is doing a lot of travelling, either through their work or through lots of extensive holidays to new and different places. I think as a matter of course, when you're on a sailboat and you are constantly moving, you can't help but end up in new and different situations. And hopefully, one would like to think, maybe learn from it, yeah, uh, or at least let it rub off on you. I mean, Pauline Skipsy on Facebook said, uh, I have a deeper respect for all people of different cultures and a greater faith in humanity since she's been sailing and traveling. Mm. Now that could, doesn't just have to be sailing, that could be travel. Do you like our coffee mugs? You can get your own from our shop. Find them at followtheboat.com forward slash shop.
I really liked Wayne's comment on, on uh, YouTube. He said, not so much cruising, so here we go, it's not just about the cruising and the boats, but I lived and worked in over 15 countries. Thinking back to my view of the world when first starting out, it's way different. For what it's worth, the main thing I learned is in some ways, we all have similar goals in life, but how we go about achieving those is sometimes different. It's not better or worse, it's just better, it's just different. Yeah, we've, we talk about this frequently, don't yeah. we? Uh, we often come back to this point that despite our cultural differences around the world, ultimately we do all want the same thing. Food on the table, education for our children. I feel like I'm repeating myself because we, we have said this so frequently <laughs> and I think, but it's really important to get this across mm. that we are all one nation under a groove. I know, and I, I like Pauline when she said that, that she's got a greater faith in humanity. I really think that. You know, before, when we left the UK, I was burnt out and fed up and pissed off and hated everybody and everything. Never wanted to see another human or have a conversation what's, or ever what's do What's changed? <laughs> There's a certain amount of me that's like that, it's true. <laughs> but I was quite cynical mm -hmm. and I think the cynicism has gone now, that it's been replaced with a certain amount of reality, but more, more it's been with, replaced by a celebration of humanity. Because we've seen nothing but goodness, I mean the occasional bad things, yeah, but they're very occasional. We've seen nothing but positivity and goodness. And it, it can't help but make you feel happy about the world. Contrary to what the media would tell you, the reality has been nothing but joyful. Yeah, why is that? I know. Is it a rose-tinted spectacle outlook that we have where you know we're easily entertained, easily excited by new experiences, maybe that's it. Maybe we are unconsciously, subconsciously turning our eyes away from the bad side of things, you know, only looking for good and positive experiences? I think there's some merit not understanding languages because mm. you only have interaction with people that either speak English or we're able to communicate with Google Translate and pointing and blah, blah, blah and all of that. So the, the actual channel of communication is quite narrow mm. for a lot of the time and we and we're talking to people who are engaged and interested in us now. I think most people, all people that we talk to are full of smiles. It's great. They, they really want to help you. There is a difference between that and the kind of help you get in the UK. Where, you know, here we, we stop at an island, we get off the boat, we take the dinghy ashore and someone says, here, do you want to use my motorbike for a, for a day, no charge, so you can have a good look around our island? And that wouldn't happen in Europe. <laughs> It's just one example of many things. That, there's that. But on mm. the other hand, I think the fact that we don't know what's being said around us does shield us from all the shit. Because, mm. you know, I've said to you before, as we're walking through a mall and people are stopping and talking to us all down the street in a fishing village, they're probably saying, look at those fat bastards from Europe, think they're fantastic, you know? Uh, I'm going to nick their boat, or look at her, or look at him. You know, there's probably all kinds of things being said that we can't hear, and that's fine. <laughs> That's fine. There's just, all go on. Yeah, I'm just trying to think. But what's that got to do with change? Uh, you know, our our, well, our perspective on humanity hasn't hasn't changed. No, has changed. Has changed. No, I said it now. I I'm I think humanity is great, whereas I didn't before I started living on the boat and traveling the world. Yes. Now, how, would someone on land? go through those same changes? I think they'd be, if they were travellers, I think it's mm. about the, tra the travel it's is the, the common denominator. Yeah. If, you, if I'd just stayed at home in the UK, reading newspapers and watching the news, my view of the world, I believe, would be very different to what it is now. Mm -hmm. It would have remained as it was, quite cynical, fed up, pissed off, and constantly marching against this and that, and being totally wrapped up in all of that. If you find this topic interesting and would like to continue the conversation, come and join the Follow the Boat Discord community. Look for the link in the description. It's free. Can I bring up a subject which I think is perhaps going to be the deepest, most philosophical change that has happened in the last 20 or so years? I'll be the judge of that. <laughs> but it chimed obviously with a few people. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, I'll start with uh, Pauline again, actually, who said being out on the vast ocean also helps you get things into perspective, realizing I am just a speck in the universe and history. And Urger on Facebook says, realization, I'm not invincible. And then Jordan, now, I should encourage you to join our Discord group because Jordan has written entire tomes on this <laughs> subject and in among his entire tomes are some absolute gems and he said I can no longer forget just how small and insignificant I truly am seeing the skies at night the horizon during the day the clear depths beneath me it becomes almost impossible to forget because each of these things is very much in my face reminder and he sort of leads into what I wanted to talk about was that moment of realization, I think I had when I was halfway across the Atlantic. Right. Just that absolute insignificance, the tiny dot of insignificance that you are on the vast ocean. I think in videos, and I've said it recently, I frequently say my favorite time on the boat is out in the open oceans with a nice breeze and looking out across the horizon, seeing nothing but sea and sky. Yeah. And part of that is me embracing my insignificance. It's interesting that you embrace it, though. I do this. I do exactly the same. We've had this chat. Some people can't take it. Mm. And so what is the change? Do you think so? It's about the ego, isn't it? So I'd say that one of the things I've learned from before and now is that I used to think I wasn't egotistical. I, I work strive very hard not to be because I knew that we all are and you try to identify it in yourself and not be it. Whereas now, after all this time, particularly at sea, when we're on our own and there's nothing but us, and you had those moments to just contemplate your insignificance, I absolutely love it. Mm. I embrace it and I like being a part of this thing and not being the centre of it. I think so. And I, I think that stripping away of that ego helps you become perhaps more accepting of your um, own mortality mm. because you know that when you die life will carry on without you as if you were never here mm. and while that's quite hard to take on board and accept at the same time it's quite encouraging to know that life will continue without you. It's because we love life, we celebrate the earth, I think, for me, this is how it works. I love the ocean, I love all the things in it, even the nasty, creepy, crawly, nasty things that bite. And the things on land, I love the ocean, the ocean, I love the mountains, the rainforest, all of those incredible things. And it's brilliant to know they're going to do fine without me. Mm. Um, yeah, so it was George Eliot when she wrote Middlemarch. There was a passage in there that I loved when I was 17, and it struck me just like your crossing the ocean struck you. Uh, there's a passage in it where she says that if you take a candle and you hold it over a, a polished area, an area that's been polished, it looks like all the scratches are radiating out of your candle. So you're basically the centre of everything. If you take the candle flame away, all those scratches are going in every haphazard direction there is. So the only thing that makes you the centre is you, Precisely. not the table itself, exactly. not the surface. Exactly that, exactly. I love that. That was, I read that at 17, was massively hit like a thunderbolt about that. And I have tried to live my life like that. But then the moment I start feeling, oh, I'm doing it, I think, no, 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 now you're, feeling, now you're being egotistical again. It's a difficult one. Yeah, and I think for those living on land, I think this is perhaps one of those realizations some people go through and other people don't. Uh, you know, realizing that you aren't the center of the universe. Of and being we, comfortable with it. And being comfortable with it, yes. And we know many people, as you say, who are, are either are not comfortable with that or perhaps still uh, live their lives as if they are the center of the universe. And we know grown up adults who behave like that. There are loads. Yeah. Um, but just that constant reminder, and I think that's the difference between living on land and being on boat, is as Jordan says, it's that constant reminder. You look out at the ocean. One thing that he did say was, and, and I'd never really thought about this before, the mass sky above you and the mass ocean beneath you, and you're floating in the middle, anchored, tethered to this stainless steel 10 mil chain that you know of just 30 meters taking you down to the ground but all around you is life 
that would carry on without you. And so it is that constant reminder. You are reminded of it every day. And I think as sailors, we embrace it. Mm. As a successful cruisers and ocean going sailors, they all embrace it. They all have that fatalism that Salty Lass taught, talked about. Mm. So yeah, we could die. This is dangerous. You can be in a lot of danger, but you're part of all of this and something might happen, but you sort of, you know, what the hell, just carry on and, and you have to em embrace it. You have to embrace it, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Don't let it overwhelm you, let it invigorate you. Yeah. I mean, just going off to what Jordan said, he, he has a more intimate understanding and appreciation of everything that happens behind the scenes. So he, he says, when you look at a town, uh, he's suddenly thinking about how the electricity is distributed, how the internet and the cell phones work, and what happens with the cell phones, how do they work? And then he thinks about farming, and this is really just, um, when you move on to a boat, you lose all those creature comforts you have ashore. Mm -hmm those systems in place that will transport you from A to B easy without you having to think about it. The trash removal, uh, you know, out of sight, out of mind, put it in your bin, someone picks it up and, it, and it's gone and you don't have to think about it. Uh, water even, you know, you turn a tap on when you're on land and out comes water and you don't think about how that water got there. So what's the change then, so you, going back to you know, our team? So you take a lot of these systems for granted uh, but when you move on to a boat, a lot of these systems you have to manage yourself. Mm. And so, and of course, a lot of these uh, resources, they are finite, mm. like water. We can only carry 650 litres of water on board. So we have to think about where we get the water from, how much we use it. I'm not sure how much this has changed, you know, how you can apply that to the subject of this podcast, which is change. I get that's a practical change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have to think of all those things now, which we never did before. So what's the change in our... Because now you look at how people live on land differently. Right. Because you're looking at all the systems on land. It gives us a greater appreciation, for example, when we go to, uh, we're working on an episode on Gilly Geddy, yeah. that still does not have running water. Yeah. And you get that as a cruiser. You understand what it's like to not have running water. When you live on land, certainly in the West, you don't even give that a thought because your water is constantly being supplied to you. So the difference is that we now really appreciate the things that we just took for granted yeah. earlier on. Okay, yeah. yeah, I can get that. That's a, yeah, good. I like that. And that go kind of goes on to something else that I jotted down. It's similar, really. I've put... <laughs> stuff and the material worth of things. Mm. So I now put far more value on experiences and memories than anything else. So particularly British people, we come from a place where you evaluate everything and you evaluate people. So you look at their job, their education, what their house is, what their car is, all of those things, and you evaluate them like that. And it's very difficult to get out of that. And there are plenty of cruisers who do it, not just Brits, all over the world. People are evaluating each other all the time. I don't do that. Just don't do it anymore. I have no interest in it. When people ask me what I did or what house we've got or where I went to school, I don't bother answering or I change the subject. It's not of consequence to me anymore. Well, I think, I think that's where you and I differ because mm. I don't think I've ever been like that. Right. I really don't. Mm. I genuinely believe that. I have never, uh, I think because, I don't know, I never wanted the best car, the biggest house. I never had those desires to have those material goods that set your status. Um, of course, I'm obsessed with things like camera gear, that, well, that kind of thing. That's it. You see, I was never into the biggest house or the, or the biggest, best car. I like shoes. <laughs> so I have too many shoes but, and a lot of clothes. Yeah, shoes, they're not really functional, really. No. Cameras are very important. Oh, right, okay. but you only need one. <laughs> You still like to collect your cameras. I do, I do. And you used to collect shoes. Look at all the, your trainers. Trainers, I suppose so. So yes. I think, you know, when you say material things, it can cover anything. Yes. Uh, I mean, I went slightly off at a tangent with the uh, status thing, but it was brilliant, was it not, when we got onto the boat, and everyone who's done it has, to, has had to do this, is when you just get rid of so much stuff. Downsizing. Yeah, you downsize. Yeah. Um, 
who is it who said this? It was Sailing Mahina, Sailing Living on a Boat, made me realise I can live with less. And although it was very cathartic to empty my three bedroom house and give most of my stuff away, I don't miss it. Mm. The main thing I miss is my washing machine, with you there. <laughs> but yeah, giving all that stuff away, mountains of stuff we gave away, and you'd think that it would be painful. You know, your trainers, my shoes, all my, my high fashion stuff, because that was the industry I was in. It was. No, it wasn't. It was. It was a little bit painful for just a moment, like picking off a scab, but then, uh, then it felt great uh, afterwards. I'm joshing, <laughs> yes, yes. Definitely downsizing. It's a thing that I think you can only really experience uh, on a boat because the downsizing process is extreme. Yeah. The space that you're living in is so much smaller yeah. than even a one bedroom flat or apartment on land. Yeah, and you just have less interest in, in acquiring things. Apart from, you know, you like, you like your cameras. Um, I like picking things off the beach, I don't know. There's, there's a few bits and bobs, but really our clothes now are functional. We have one or two shots we go to, we just get, you know, a shirt, pair of shorts, flip flops. I've even slowed down on buying the yeah, you did. The bright shirts. <laughs> we did have 50 shirts at one stage in India because they were so cheap. You could just buy the fabric and they make you for you. But I don't think you do that anymore. No. I think you've changed. Yes, yes, definitely. Just, it's just camera gear now. We need so much less and it is fantastic. So the reason I put that in is that looking, at, as I've already said, at nature, it, it just brings you so much, so much oh, interest. You know, having this ability to look at the mountains and the sea, it's fantastic. I'd rather do that than look at a nice painting that cost a million quid on the wall. I'd rather look out here and see the rainforest mm. and not need something that's worth a lot of money to so, look at. So, so do you recognise that change in yourself yes. then? Yeah. Yes, yes I do, yeah. Yeah, there were things that meant, you know, I mean I, I liked antiques and old things and all that sort of thing and one or two, I had a nice house, an old, beautiful, listed Georgian house and all of that. All nice, I can appreciate it still from the art point of view and yeah. I can appreciate fashion from design. I'm still interested in fabrics and techniques and that sort of thing, textiles. Not interested in high fashion anymore. Um, and I like, I like a good antique, but I don't feel the need to own any of these things. Understood. That's my difference. <laughs> yep, I'm sure that chimes with most most cruisers. Yeah, oh yes, I put down here the value of a hot shower. Uh, and that was 24 hour travellers said that's one of the things that they've learned to value. Well, that goes back to Jordan's uh, point about, you know, those luxuries that you have on land versus yes. versus at sea. It does, yes. There are certain things that you don't have on a boat or can't have access to easily, like a hot shower. Yeah that uh, you appreciate a lot more. So I think we've, we've cut a lot of, covered a lot of topics, but yeah. we should, before we wrap up, there is one last topic we really need to discuss that so many people commented on. And that is on relationships. Oh gosh, yes, yes, yes. And, and how our relationship between ourselves as cruising couples, how that changes over a, a period of years. It does indeed. Did you know that liking and subscribing on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts helps us to get noticed? Go on, give us a helping hand. Christina Palmer on Facebook says, I think the relationship you develop over so many years together afloat is one of a kind, a very special one. The challenges you face along the way, the intense time spent together, along with all the incredible experiences a life of travel itself brings with it. And, they, and she says that she actually brought up two children along the way, which is another whole dimension and perspective mm -hmm. to consider. And Yes, the, so again, this is going back to comparing our relationship on a boat with, you know, what uh, a relationship is like on land as a couple. I don't know what we would have been like if we hadn't had a boat. I think that the, it was the boat that bound us. Correct. However, I would say, so we talk often as cruisers about working as a team. Mm. And I don't want to belittle relationships on land because, you know, relationships on land, if you think of a young family starting out, bringing up children, the husband and wife, the parents, they have to work as a team as well. Uh, I think the difference is, is that when you're on a boat, 
sometimes those situations that arise happen very, very quickly. Mm, and they are th life threatening yes. sometimes. And so your communication with each other has to be sort of shortened, abridged, and uh, you have to understand what each other is going to do uh, in a very fast situation. And know, I need to know that you are capable of dealing with whatever it is you have to deal with under these specific circumstances. Those situations can happen quickly. Yes, um, and you, you, you work that out through experience over mm. the years. So when we first started out, the way we worked very diff different to now. Now we preempt. We kind of know what the other one's going to do. We don't even have to use words sometimes. I mean, that's because we've got systems in place that we just have have organically grown. Yeah. But it really does. Matter. And in fact, uh, I want to read um, this one, which was, I don't know how to say the name. Marijka 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 on Instagram. Really strange uh, name. Just put down Sally or something. So much easier. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> This person, who I don't even know the sex of, we sailed for five years, the best time of our life and marriage. It's going off from what you say. Mm. We're still together, but it's different because on shore you have your own life by chasing jobs, education, etc. On the boat, you're a couple and a team. So she or he, they have experience of both and, and they're finding now that they're on land that they're going slightly their separate ways and doing their own thing, which is much harder on a boat, isn't it? There's no escape. <laughs> no, there's no escape. You've got to work out how to do things together successfully. Well, we have talked about this extensively, about how it's important to have other interests mm. apart from the boat itself. And that is where our interests can differ. And your interests and my interests do differ. So we do allow each other that, that space. And I guess that's what this person is talking about, how you know they're on land and so they, they they're still together, but there are slight differences in what they're doing on land. It sounds like they're missing the fact that they were a team from what that's being said here. Yeah, now, I guess that has definitely changed over the years, this working as a team. You know, we've always been a team, Yeah. but we have a lot more confidence in each other and acceptance, I suppose, uh, of no, each other's abilities. Our strengths and weaknesses. So. Yeah. Sorry for interrupting, but while I've got you here, if you like what we do and you want to support us and become a Patreon or join us on FTB Mates or even drop a quid in the rum fund, go to followtheboat.com forward slash pub. Of course, come to the pub. This idea of working as a team under stressful situations has obviously chimed with certainly other cruisers out there. I just wanted to mention uh, Wens on Discord who says in the past 10 years both uh, my husband Alex and I have changed through sailing. Their communication skills have improved which is what we were talking about especially around stressful situations which we know happen on boats and uh, Wendy Kilgariff also says the same thing. Um, I don't know, actually, is that the same person, Wendy and Wens? No, I think they're different. They they're are, different right. Women. Okay, my apologies, Wendy and Wens. Uh, we have had to say, uh, we've had to really learn to communicate and sort stuff out pretty fast, be really honest about what is our crap, and not the other person they're actually talking about, <laughs> <laughs> responsibilities. Yes. Uh, but uh, both of these allude to this idea of being A, in stressful situations, and B, in very tight circumstances. Yeah, so physical circumstances. Do you think cruisers like that? Do you think we like the ch to put ourselves through these difficult challenges and these difficult situations? And it's, it's how we react to them that, that matters and changes us. Yes, I think there was always a part of me and still is now uh, a part of me that always wants to be stimulated. Yeah. Always. I mentioned very early on in this podcast that I couldn't sit still for more than five minutes. And I think that comes about from always wanting to be stimulated. And I still feel like that now, although I'm a bit more relaxed about it. And so we put ourselves in these situations and I'm fortunate that I have found the right partner to do it with, who I feel comfortable with to put myself in these extreme situations. Yes. I didn't know this 20 years ago when I first met you. That's what's changed. Mm. I think if it hadn't worked, we wouldn't be together now. Yeah, we didn't know how the other one was going to react. Mm. And most of the time we're pretty phlegmatic about things and practically get on with things. There are times when one or the other well, we can't have, cope with it. We have our moments. Yeah, and then the other one steps in. Yeah. It's, so yeah, 
So the change is, so to keep trying to bring it back to what this is all about, so the, the changes are um, an understanding now about, for me, about myself, like you, I didn't really think that I needed to be constantly stimulated. I knew that I needed to always be travelling and never stuck in one place. That was, that was something that fired this whole adventure for me. Mm. But what I have realised, I don't think it's because I've got older, but I have to be doing something all the time. I'm finding it very difficult to read a book or watch a film or watch anything. I'm constantly researching. I'm online looking up things, looking at quotes, reading this and that, finding out about Flores or the ASEAN and learning all the countries and it's just constantly needing stimulation mm. more I think some, in, in some ways. I don't, don't know whether it's our specific situation right now. Um, I mean even when we think ahead we talk frequently about what we're going to be doing in the future in inverted com yeah. commas and the plans always have to include something that will keep the grey matter ticking over and also the physical side of things is we've got to remain active. That bit hasn't changed. No. We have always been like that. So I think we've covered a lot there and we should just give a big shout out to everyone who commented yes. across our social media and just emphasise Discord again. It is such a great place for people to communicate and for us to respond. So if you haven't yet checked it out, please do go and check out our Discord channel, our Discord server. Rather. And if you haven't seen the before and after photo of you and me, <laughs> go and have a look on our Instagram page. You'll see, you'll see us in oh, 16 years ago and now. And let us know if you think we've changed much. And also let us know if you've changed much, because I really find this subject fascinating. Mm. We do, don't we? Definitely. Shall we end up with a Discord quote? Yes. So we're ready to finish now. Yep, OK. Listen. Thanks for listening. This is from Salty Lass. Once again, we can always rely on Salty Lass to give us a cracker of a comment here. And they said, if sailing does not change you, you might as well sell the boat. <laughs>